Zone! Matthew wasn't brought to LA to play good. He was brought to LA to be a difference maker. Do nothing but look in the mirror, find ways to get better, try to be as fundamentally sound as I possibly can at all times. If I'm another team watching this game, you can target those linebackers. Samuel takes the handoff out of the backfield and into the end zone. Just the momentum and the flow of the game, not nearly good enough, and it starts with me. Welcome to NFL. We'll see if Elmer Fudd can join us for the rest of the show. Russell Wilson is going to leave Seattle after this season, somebody says. It Get could, it out, El Could Boogie. be the guy who's moving his shoulders over there. Mina Kimes, Dan Orlovsky, Marcus Spears is here. Diana Rossini will join us in a bit. Like Don't miss time? our in-depth like conversation like that ties thing. nice on the evolution of offenses in the NFL while Bill, why Bill Belichick saw it coming before anyone else. But we begin with the Rams, you guys, who have lost three straight games, even after amassing all that talent this this season. It's not sitting well, by the way, with cornerback Jalen Ramsey. Here he is after Sunday's loss. We have guys that are way too good for us to be losing games like this. Um, and losing games in a row, we have, I mean, we just got to get it right. We got we to play better. We got to, everything has to be better um, because we're too good to be, to be losing games like this, but we're not playing. Um, we're not playing like we're that good right now so we gotta we gotta correct our correct our stuff okay so the three game losing streak comes after a seven and one start to the season while Matt Stafford has struggled at times the Rams defense has not held up their end of the bargain either LA's defense allowing 10 more points a game during their losing streak and a QBR of 74 compared to 41 in the first stretch but maybe worst of all over their last three games They've allowed an 80% red zone efficiency, not being able to stop teams when it mattered most. Marcus, what do you think's wrong with the Rams defense right now? We get blinded by Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey, and we don't look at the other nine guys out there that are not performing at the level that they should be. The second thing is Aaron Donald is getting double teamed every single play. That's not anything that's out of the ordinary. But last year, other guys with their one-on-ones won a lot, i.e. Leonard Floyd. That's why he ended up with a bigger contract. We've talked about this on this show a thousand times. Everybody should benefit from playing with Aaron Donald. Lauren gave me a stat, I'll research it. Aaron Donald has the highest pass rush win rate in the NFL against double teams, 36 of them. The next closest guy is 23. Mm. You know what that means? The dude is still being more productive than the guys that are getting one-on-ones on his own football team. That's the issue. And we talked about this the other day, Dio. I said, look, man, I firmly believe that the Los Angeles Rams miss Michael Brock. I think that's one of the most significant misses that they have because, number one, he had length. Number two, he was able to win a lot of those one-on-ones. And when you look at the rest of this roster, who do you game plan for? Like, what other person on this defense do you say, we are worried about this guy wrecking our offense? No one. Right. And I don't know what has happened to Darius Williams. Yeah. He played well last year, not showing up this year. They better get it fixed because Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey is not going to win y'all a Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah I, I, my issue is they're dumb and they're soft. Mm. I think they're dumb with the way that they use Jalen Ramsey. Certainly situationally, and it showed up against the Packers game, and then soft, and I'm not t- telling their manhood, but the style of play. Now, Jalen Ramsey's up top. The tight end that he's across from is a tight end. What they do is they bring receivers on the inside. Jalen's wasted outside right now, eight yards off. This is an easy completion on second six. Here, guys, have a first down, but even more situationally. Guys, it's third and two. Up top for tight end, Green Bay-wise, is Mercedes Lewis. Third and two is a man down. Jalen Ramsey's covering Mercedes Lewis, Devontae Adams is inside on the slot against a linebacker. Here, have another first down, Green Bay. That's third and two. Third and three. Up top, Jalen Ramsey's going to match the Ooh, tight end again. The That's right Josiah here. DeGuara. Now I bring Devontae on the inside. He's on a much lesser defender. Inside slot fade. Hey, Green Bay, have another first Woo. down. And then I talk about them being soft. And again, it's not their manhood, but they don't ever challenge people on the perimeter. They just give easy completions. Second and eight, here's a seven yard out to the field. Fourth and two, here's a short little stop route in between, never contacting anybody off the line of scrimmage. Look at the cushion that they're giving these guys. These are catch and throws by the quarterback. Marcus, this one's third and three, bro. The one that drives have a quick out. They're just giving you these completions. Now, you talked about the talent on the defensive line. What the Rams are doing schematically when they play that soft. Not helping them. 
Not they're helping taking them. the defensive right. line out of the football game You're themselves. Right. You're right. So they're, situationally, I'm not pretending that you can call man every play and Jalen follows Devontae every play, but third and two and third and three. Bro, that's Pee Wee football. We can't put our best guy in your they best They need guy? three yards. Put your feet at three yards. Quarterbacks that's... are getting the ball out so quickly against them. Yeah. There's a bit of a blueprint um, there. You know, it was really interesting kind of that particular contrast between the Packers and the Rams because Joe Barry – uh, who's the Packers defensive coordinator, comes from the Rams. And we've talked about this before, yeah. kind of that tree. And um, a big part of the Packers' improvement on defense has been the play of their linebackers. Mm -hmm. Not just Devondre Campbell, also Chris Barnes, I think, has been really good. Contrast that with Los Angeles. You talked about it. There were a couple targets in there where they went after Troy Reeder, uh, who plays linebacker for the Rams, number 51. And it occurred to me, like, as, that's been a problem in Green Bay for a while, and it feels like they finally solved it. The Rams haven't solved linebackers, linebacker. like and, cover. and I think right now in the NFL, more than ever, you're seeing teams, offenses exploit teams who kind of lack that sideline to sideline linebacker play. Absolutely. And you've got a team like the Rams where you've got a star defensive tackle and a star cornerback, but in the middle, they're getting attacked, and yeah. it's happening week after week. Bay, how Good important point. it is to have two linebackers. Right, right exactly. And by the way, we are going to maybe see them right the ship because they play the Jaguars next at home. So that might be a way to get off the schneid. All right, <laughs> that's on Monday night, too. Okay, let's get back to last night. Uh, Washington football team hosting the Seahawks. We're going to pick this up in the fourth quarter, guys. Washington up by eight, going for it on fourth and goal here. Taylor Heineke. With a big chance here, throwing to Logan. So Thomas much time. A touchdown. All right, so we think it's a touchdown, but then the play would be reviewed. Yeah. And what'd you see here, Dan? Well, I thought he crossed it, and then I thought that the ball hit the ground but didn't move. The officiating crew can. I actually thought they got this one right. That I thought that call, was the right call. It was reversed, but 23 seconds to left. Seahawks still have a Ooh, chance to. Freddie Swain! Russell Wilson finds Freddie Swain. 32 yard score there. Seahawks now down by two. So the two point conversion attempt and. Doesn't go the way they planned it, Dan. Yeah, I think this is the right decision by Russell. It's just late. You know, that, that backside safety went with DK. And if he threw it right, right watch this, the backside safety 20. No, that safety right now goes with DK. Ooh. He threw it early. Yeah. He had him. But he kind of, like, wanted to get DK as a decoy. And he's just late. And that forces the breakup. So, Man, Washington wins. Problem. Yeah, 17 to 15. And Heineke realized a dream. He said he wanted to win on... Monday Night Football. I think he's a man, dude. It's a regular season ended right now. Look at that, guys. Washington would own the final wild card spot, but there's still plenty of football ahead. Washington's 22% chance to make the playoffs. Trails behind other non-division leaders like the Rams, 49ers, Vikings, Saints, and even the Eagles. So Washington's playoff hopes alive and well, okay, but Seattle, not so much, especially after last night. We said it was must win. They didn't win. Dan, why hasn't the offense clicked since Russ returned from injury? Yeah, I mean, detail-wise, the Seahawks offense is one of the worst units in all of football, detail-wise. And you can't say that the separation is in the preparation when no one else on your offense looks like they're prepared. All right, so this is just going to be a play-action pass, two-man route, and you got to check flat by your tailback. Now, the landmark for your tailback should be two yards past the line of scrimmage. This is the first play in the second half. He's two yards behind the line of scrimmage. This is the right read by Russell Wilson. Kick it out to the flat. You catch the ball three yards behind the line of scrimmage, you end up in second and 12 after a completion. Now protection, this is the story of Russell Wilson right now. Six man of protection, Washington is giving you seven. Dude, have a plan if all guys come, initially they do and they drop out, you're not getting protection, but Russell's almost like, oh, we're good. This is something we talked about last year with Russell Wilson, just a lack of plan with the details of your protection. Yep. But you watch this team. They throw a screen to Gerald Everett last night. He catches it five yards behind the line of scrimmage. It's an inside screen. He turns outside, yeah. Yeah. and it's a six-yard gain instead of a 25-yard gain. The deep, you don't fall to the, the level of your preparation. You don't rise to the level of your preparation. You fall to the level of your expectations. And their standards are just so low on offense right now. So, Mina, what changes need to happen in Seattle to fix this going forward before next season? Because there's a lot of pressure on this, especially from the standpoint of Russell Wilson. Yeah, um, I mean, it's kind of like what changes don't need to happen watching some of that tape. You know, a lot of it is coaching and execution. But I, I think is, yeah. the single biggest problem with this football team is the front office. And how the football team is performing right now, it is the product of years of bad decisions yeah. at this point. Uh, frankly, dating back to since or right after Russell Wilson was drafted, I mean, look at their first and second round draft picks since 2013. I mean, just walking you through 
Starting from the bottom, a lot of these guys aren't on the team anymore. Chrissy Michael, Justin Britt, Paul Richardson, Frank Clark. That was actually a good trade for them. Jaron Reed, Jermaine Fetty. Postage is on the team. Hasn't been playing much. Lee McDowell was an, a, a, a kind of a complicated case. Rashad Penny, has he's been hurt, but that was a bad draft pick. That was a first rounder. DK, home run. Marquis Blair, second rounder. He's been hurt. LG Collier has been a healthy scratch. Played a bit. Uh, Daryl Taylor and Jordan Brooks, Duane A. Scratch. I, I'd say the jury's still out. Those guys were picked recently. That is a bad record. Picks on, that. on top of that, Dan, they traded first rounders for Jimmy Graham, Percy Harvin. I'm talking about since 2013. Jimmy Graham, Percy Harvin, and now more, most recently, Jamal Adams. Two first rounders. The body of work yeah. at a certain point is not great. And, and we know Pete Carroll has a hand in personnel as well in Seattle. I'm just saying, well, that's bad. Well, look at that You're list. Right. You're dead on. I mean, I, when you try to figure out what's wrong with this team, what changes need to be made, how can you ignore the elephant in the room, which is it's not been a well-run football team for a minute? Well, when you – first of all, Russ gone. All right, let's – I'm sorry, MK. I don't, sorry. I don't know. He gone. He out of there. Because I, to, to your point, Dio, and when you talked about the draft, for, I watched that game last night, and I said, I know every play that's about to happen. Yeah. That's that's the first part. When I know every play you're about to run on yeah, offense, yeah, yeah. that's a problem because I've never scouted entire offenses. <laughs> the second thing is when you look at Russ in that final presser, to me said I'm exhausted. Yeah. Like that's that's it was it was almost like a gasp of I'm a, I gotta calm the seas and the water, bro. That y'all know how I am. You heard me say this before. When dudes get to st start talking about past tense. And they start thinking about reflectionary in all of their their talks. There is something ab abroad, and yeah. I, I look at Russ. It just it's a unmotivated. There's no fun. It's nothing. Yeah, Maybe it's nothing. Some Freudian slips too in some of these press conferences. Up next for Seattle, they have San Francisco for the final time this season. Back on NFL Live, the Cowboys dealing with a COVID outbreak, which includes the head coach Mike McCarthy, who will not be able to coach the game Thursday in New Orleans against the Saints. Defensive coordinator Dan Quinn taking over the head coaching duties and owner Jerry Jones was asked about Quinn today. He's had years of on the field uh, uh, experience and been that many uh, games or that many weeks or that many months since he's been out there making those in-game calls. We're so fortunate uh, to have him. Uh, so fortunate to have him as recently as he's head coached and been on the sideline. Uh, he, if anybody can, he should be able to handle uh, what he needs to do as defensive coordinator right there on the sideline. And uh, he was obvious choice there for Mike to make. Yeah, so the Cowboys luck out a little bit there with Dan Quinn's experience. We now welcome in our NFL reporter, Diana Russini. And Diana, we just heard from Jerry Jones. You actually were able to text with Dan Quinn a little bit today. What can you tell us about the Cowboys' outlook for Thursday with this team? Yeah, in typical Dan Quinn fashion, he's obviously very excited about this opportunity to be the head coach, of course. Mike McCarthy is still very involved in the team meetings. He's going to do as much as he possibly can. We know that the Cowboys are operating virtually at this point, but Dan Quinn has the experience, as you heard Jerry Jones allude to. And, and Laura, if you recall, going back to the summer when Jerry Jones was talking about Dan Quinn, at times, it sounded like Dan Quinn was his favorite person on the planet. So he has certainly a lot of confidence that he can get this job done. So other issues, though, involving the Dallas Cowboys at this point, right? Their number one wide receiver, Amari Cooper, can get off the COVID-19 list at this point, right? So he's done the time. The problem is he still has symptoms. According to Mike McCarthy, he's still not feeling well. So basically what needs to happen is the Cowboys doctors have to clear him as well as the league. That hasn't happened yet. So he can return. He's just not feeling well. And essentially Mike McCarthy saying if Amari Cooper doesn't practice tomorrow, the chances of him traveling to New Orleans are pretty much over. So at this point right now, we still do not know whether or not Amari Cooper will be active for Thursday's game against the Saints. Yeah, certainly hope he feels better. He's missed the last couple of games. And you think about the timeline there, that's been quite a while. The horns are tooting over there, Diana. We got more from you coming a little bit later. Apparently the Dan Wagon's over there at Diana's house. All right, let's get to the 49ers. They're on a three-game win streak. Their playoff chances have gone from 22% to 70% now, before the streak at only the 22%. Helps that their three highest single-game rushing yard totals this season have come in the last three games. Right. And by the way, Debo 
Samuel expected to miss one to two weeks with a strained groin. But let's read and react around the league a little bit, Marcus. What exactly has changed for San Francisco in recent weeks? They done got back to being bullies on the block. And that's what I'm talking about, Kyle Shanahan. Stand up for the game that's supposed to be played. Listen, this team, obviously, we talked about how hard schematically it is to defend this run game. But we know using Debo, obviously, he's going to be out a week maybe or, or two. But when you look at this scheme, don't get it twisted about the bells and whistles and the thing flying across your eyes. They are road grading people. They've gotten back to what took them to a Super Bowl. In turn, Jimmy Garoppolo is playing better as well. They really just went back to square one. It, it, it's nothing magic that they've done. If you watch the San Francisco 49ers during their Super Bowl run and you watch them the last three games, a lot of things look very familiar in what they've been doing. Yeah, so basically we're just making football way too complicated. Just yes. run the ball and everything yes. works out, right? Our resident run game expert here. All right, stop me if you've heard this before about Justin Herbert. He's pretty good. In fact, he's leading the NFL in QBR right now, but he has the fifth shortest average depth of target among qualified passers. When Herbert does launch the ball at least 20 yards deep, he's got the fifth best completion percentage in the league. So, Dan, this kind of makes you say, are the Chargers holding Justin Herbert back in any way? Yes. Uh, they need to add or grow their catalog of plays. The Chargers call basically the same five plays almost all game. They're calling stick, a flat with an out route. They're calling all go special, four verticals. They're calling sail, which is, you know, a deep out route. They're calling slot option or halfback choice almost every game. Now, here's my issue. Situationally or formationally, they're the same thing on a consistent basis. Out of the same formation or third and seven plus, I'm calling the same plays or P and one, meaning the first play of possession, it's the same stuff. That was to early start the game. This is the same play in, to start the second quarter, or excuse me, the second half. Same stuff. So defenses are going to see that. They got to bring more variance to their kind of offensive scheme because right now it's the same plays over and over and over again, and they're hindering the growth of Justin Herbert. They've handcuffed him. They don't throw the ball downfield enough. But more so than that, they got to add more plays to their arsenal of offensive calls. Yeah, and as we showed you with the numbers and what you're saying, it's not like Justin Herbert can't do it. He absolutely, absolutely. can. Up next, they go to Cincinnati, and actually Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert getting to play in the NFL for the first time. All right, let's go to the OEB. Colts. A lot of focus on Jonathan Taylor, Mina, for that offense. But you think there's someone on the other side of the ball that may be the key to their success down the stretch here. Who is that? He's right there. It's Quiddy Pay. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually feel more confident in the Colts offense and the defense right now I mean don't get me wrong the defense is fundamentally sound they have struggled to rush the passer 26 in pressure rate so far this season it's kind of like the DeForest Buckner show and that's it however Quiddy Pay their first round draft pick has been coming on hot three sacks in three games you see the skills that you saw in college on display which is the freakish athleticism the high motor and if he can keep this up Colts are dangerous. Yeah, oh, we love Oh, it. there he is. Dan, what? What, Dan? Okay. Oh, because you oh, said you're more confident. I got me on my team now. It's cool. Let's go, Kyle. Wait, wait, you can't see this right now, but Dan is running around the Literally. studio, which I think is a great transition to what's coming next on NFL what? Live. <laughs> Apparently, Bill Belichick has the power to see. Anna, what can you tell us about the latest in New Orleans with running back Alvin Kamara ahead of their game on Thursday night? Yeah, we're talking three weeks that they've been without their best weapon, and every day he seems to be getting better. It's still questionable headed into this game. He was seen at practice this afternoon. He was participating in some red zone offense, obviously. That usually is a good sign, but I've also covered enough teams and have seen players participate in red zone, and they're inactive. Uh, from what I can gather in terms of talking to some people, this is going to be a day-to-day -day decision. Then on the other side, we've got the Taysom Hill situation and Trevor Simeon. What are the Saints going to do with the starting quarterback position? Sean Payton saying that right now it could be either or. But really what you should keep an eye on here is the fact that this offensive line is completely beat up. So when you see an offensive line that's beat up, you know that that means that most likely the run game needs to be a big part of their game. That runner being Taysom Hill. So it would make all the sense in the world if Hill was to get this start. And then finally, Arizona, right? Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins, they've been out for almost a month, Laura. And all signs are pointing up for both of these players. Head coach Kip, Cliff Kingsbury talking to the media, saying that 
they're starting to look really good and it's really going to come down to how they feel at practice over the next few days so that could be obviously really good news for a team that did really well without their stars. I was going to say, I mean, they weathered the storm without their two best guys, which is pretty impressive considering how a lot of teams would have fared there. Thanks, Diana, for the latest around the NFL here. And today, guys, we're taking a deep dive into the evolution of offenses in the NFL, why the product we're seeing on the field has changed drastically in a short period of time. How has it changed? Well, one metric in particular tells the story. Look at this. Rushes plus completions per game. So here's the list of the teams who average the most completed passes and rush attempts. You may be asking, what's the relevance? Well, seven of these teams are mm. first in their division rankings. The other three are second. They're mm. the best in the NFL right now. So, guys, we see the correlation between having a high mark in this stat and success thus far in the season. But can we explain the cause? And that's what we want to do here. Once again, the rushes plus completions per game, the really important thing here. Dan, what has caused teams to lean into this as an important metric? Well, that graphic, that's kind of the era that we grew up in. You know, that was something that we heard a lot of times is the good teams offensively, they would, you know, 55 rushing and completion attempts per game. And then there was that transition in the NFL, kind of like 2013, where it became spread and shred, spread them out, and we're going to throw the ball over the place. It was really because the RPO game transitioned mm -hmm. to the NFL. We saw so much man coverage because of it. And now defenses have changed. And it's a different NFL, and it shocks me how much it's changed and how quickly. First of all, teams are blitzing way less. They're playing much more zone coverage. They're giving quarterbacks way less, kind of those one-on-one, -on -one, easy kind of recess. My guy better than your guy type of throws. Defenses are playing way more of those two shells, right? When you're doing that, you're daring teams or challenging teams. You got to run the football. Quarterbacks got to be patient. Check the, the ball down. These athletic quarterbacks, you got to just take those five-yard completions. Um, they're taking away the explosive plays. They're challenging offenses. You got to go on 10, 12 play drives over and over and over again because you're going to make a mistake along the way, right? You're going to uh, hold the ball, get a penalty, force it, and it's going to be a turnover. So they're challenging and then they're thinking, well, we're going to be really good on third downs or we'll be really good defensively in the red zone and we're forced those field goals. It very much so has gone back in time 20 years ago mm -hmm. to kind of when you and I entered the NFL. Mm -hmm. And the teams that have adjusted the best are those teams that are playing good offense right now. And there's teams that are still stuck in kind of that 2018, 2019 world. It is not 2018 or 2019 anymore. You know, if we're, we're not going to have quarterbacks thrown for 55 touchdowns or 5,000 plus yards. It's just not the way that defenses are allowing offenses to play right now. So since week six, basically, you know, halfway since the beginning of the season, the number one offense in the NFL is the New England Patriots using EPA per play, which basically accounts for, you know, game situation. The number two offense is the Indianapolis Colts. Wow. That is wild yeah. to me. And, um, it reflects exactly what Dan oh, is saying. Game. Yeah, which is uh, two, two run games, but also two teams that can string together long drives with completions as well, as you're yeah. saying, through the air. Um, maybe not necessarily explosive drives, although Indianapolis has an explosive passing attack. And it really, it, it's incredible, I think, because it, it's rooted in what we're seeing now. But as you said, a lot of it has to do with what happened the previous five years, which is, the trend in football you're describing, basically spread it out, bombs away, that changed how teams were built. Yes. Teams, defenses, were living in their sub packages. They still are for the most sub part. Packages. So they went lighter and having five or more DBs on the field. Yeah. So you're investing your resources into safeties and cornerbacks yep. and, and your pass rush, but you know, not so much size. And all of a sudden, you have a team like New England that is sort of zigged whereas i mean granted they have a very good secondary but offensively i'm just saying they, they have built an offense that can win with power yeah. with size i mean look at their offensive line look how yeah. big those dudes are and suddenly if you're a defense that doesn't have that size how do you match up with yeah. them yep. when they get into two tight end sets or put, we put two running backs on the field we're about to see that new england team play a buffalo bills team that i think was built the other way, 19, 20, yeah. exactly, and, and it's suddenly a Styles make it makes fights challenge for Buffalo because not because they're worse or whatnot, but because they're simply built different. It's that just game crazy on Monday Night me. Football, by the way. Yeah, Sorry, it's yeah. crazy to me how quickly it happened. Yeah, like how yeah. quickly it changed back to twenty yeah. years ago. Y'all know I'm old school. It never changed for me, and I get it. Like totally understand. It, it, so the way I was brought up in football, right. playing for Nick Saban and Bill Parcells, was that. 
from an offensive standpoint, the run game dictates to the defense. That is how coordinators want to dictate what they can do from an offensive perspective. That is my mindset. So when everybody at home hear me say run the damn ball so much, that's the school of thought that I come from. And then when I look at the NFL, and, and it's been little hints there even beyond New England, because the reason Baltimore has won a lot of regular season games is because they played that old school style of football that you would see once in a while when, you know, they go, they go toed it 40 times when you coming off four weeks of right. defending the past Imagine 50 times. if they times. were healthy, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. so th this is always for me, the way I've looked at football, I've just, from a very general term, the teams that run the football have more success but, consistently. But, well, I think, there was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I think you got to be able to do both. Is, is oh, absolutely. Like, at, at, at the moment in particular, like you mentioned the Ravens, we just saw them dare Cleveland to throw the ball. <laughs> and look, Baker's hurt and all that. Right. But I'm just saying, like, you have to have the, the sort of versatility on offense that over the past five years previous to this, you didn't need that. Correct. You could be like a that, team that only threw the ball, and it was fine. I mean, yeah. The like, runs and completions graphic in 2018, 2019, that did not matter. Exactly. Those, those teams were not relevant. It was you, creating explosive plays and how many points you could score. And nowadays, it's just not the case. But I, I, look, even during that time, Gurley was in L.A. running yeah, over people. But they people. were a throw first team. And New England was I a know, throw first team. Philly man, was a throw team. But that's, it, it's, I'm not talking about what type. You, you can be throw first. Right. But they My point scored. has always been you are going to have to come back to the run game. Well. But there was an point. era in the NFL where that was not a reality. Oh, I, I now totally is, disagree with that, bro. I, mean, yeah. I totally disagree with that. I mean, you know, the you know, interesting the thing, I think, guys, about all this is somehow Bill Belichick she looked across the league. He saw all the personnel and all these teams. He said, you know what? I'm going to build my team differently. I'm going to make this zag when it's going to benefit me most. Still to come, the team points, including dominating the Steelers Sunday, holding them to just 10 points. But then... He got five games decided by three points or fewer this season and not being able to close them out. Just a little inconsistent from this team. But Marcus, how did the Bengals defense keep Pittsburgh in check the way that they did Sunday? The frustration you see on Big Ben's face nice. is really very telling. That was really the story of the entire game. They got back to getting pressure on the quarterback with four. Trey Henderson had a strip sack. Hubbard was getting home. And then when you look at these DBs, like we talked about with the Rams, y'all, these dudes were squatting. Mm -hmm. They were wait like, hey, we know being no, about to throw it, we ain't scared of you. He hit one. He Eli Apple intercepted one, and then he hit Chase Claypool on another one down the sideline. Yeah, in football, you got athletes. You gonna make those plays, but I'm a bet that Ben Roethlisberger is gonna stand back there, who's immobile, and he's got to get the ball out of his hands fast. And the thing that disappointed me more than anything about watching that game, it was the same plan that the Bengals beat them with last year that yeah. knocked them off their high hearts when they were winning all of those games. So listen. That team, the Bengals are very dangerous in this regard. If that front four gets going, they got guys on the back end that's going to take the ball away. And I don't know, it, like once you get into the playoffs, it becomes about playmakers yeah. a lot. Yeah. And the Bengals have a lot of playmakers on this football team with that run game helping them. Yeah. Speaking of said run game, I think there's <laughs> oh, been a seismic, seismic shift in their offense, and it's to the outside zone run game. Yo, I'm breaking this down. Okay. I'm, this, I'm actually, like, super, super excited yeah, for this one. The outside clap. zone run game has become a foundational part, an identity part for this offense. Now, when I talk about the outside zone, I'm going to use the word synchronicity. Big word. I got it right. Good job, okay. Dan. So everyone pay attention because this is outside zone. Joe Mixon, they ran it eight times the other day. I think it's become a huge part of who they can be because you can build so much stuff off of it. Now, when you talk about the outside zone, first starts with this offensive line. There's a couple of things we got to pay attention to as we go. Now, everyone pay attention to the left arm, okay? Look at the left arm of all these guys. This bent, bent left arm, everyone has their left arm in that L position. Now, the second thing is the steps. When you, do, when you do that left arm to start off, you want everyone's right foot to be in the ground. So as you step, you got the arm coming up and the right foot in the ground. Now everyone's left foot's gotta be up off the ground. See that synchronicity right there? Everybody's stepping to the same direction. That is outstanding by those five guys up front. The next step is the back. Outside zone is two things, your track and your angle. His starting track has got to be that outside leg of that tight end right there. Joe Mixon has got to aim there no matter what. That's your starting point. And the second thing is you are paying attention to that block right there, that three technique, that five technique, wherever he goes, 
you go opposite. So the starting point synchronization is great, and the track by Joe Mixon is fantastic. Now we go to the double team. So here's this block right here. Those two guys right here, they got these two guys. That's the double team, one to two. Now this block right here, between the center and the guard, these one two, these got these one two. Now I've never pretended to know how hard this block is because these guys got to do such a great job of that right arm for the center staying there as he climbs up to that guy and then big fella right guard has got to do everything he can to fight across keep his helmet across and get that defensive tackle the last part is this back you got to press the hole what that means is you got to get to the line of scrimmage so often backs try to make a cut before you got to get to the line of scrimmage. Now often guys, oh, I'll try to cut back there. No, Joe Mixon, press the line of scrimmage. And there's that block right here. I told you there's the block right there. There is that perfect blocking seam in that outside zone. And that is a huge chunk. It's become a big part of their offense. Now, I got a question, don't fail me, okay? Oh no. Oh, no. Who's Waste one of time. the best kind of zone run game coaches ever. Like the father, yes. Alex Gibbs. Alex Gibbs, oh, yeah. offensive line coach for the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah. Frank Pollock Frank learned under Alex Gibbs. Now, Shanahan too. No, who's one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL right now? Right now? Right now. Right. Callahan. Callahan. Bill Callahan. Bill Callahan. You know who his son is? Ooh. Brian, Brian Callahan. You know who the saying. offensive coordinator for the Bengals is? Brian Callahan. A plus is on the quizzes. Quiz, Nina. Shots. Hey, Good job. Um, I used to I used to be devastated seeing Clint Portis in you that You see that outside zone right there? It's, it's the just, worst. Well, it's all about execution. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've watched all the Bengals yeah. runs. It's literally like the same thing over. But it is, it's, it's all about the, the players and how they execute. Um, I love the Bengals run game right now for all the reasons Dan described. I also just love the Bengals receiving group. Mm. Uh, yeah. it, it, they're almost like a basketball team because mm. they have such complementary skill sets. So right love now. That. Joe Burrow is second in the NFL in yards per dropback versus man coverage. Some of that is because of Joe Burrow. A lot of it is because he has not one, but two receivers who are just deadly, deadly versus man in Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. T. Higgins, especially in this game, his uh, receiving his skills versus man on display. And then if you're a defense and you're like, okay, well, we're going to play zone against you, then He's got Tyler Boyd yeah. and Uzama yeah. working underneath. They've got like a different guy they for every squad. defensive look, and, and it, it's such a great yeah, group of guys. Skill position what was your hard. big word? Synchro synchronicity? Yeah. All right, you know what? I actually, Dan, it's synchronicity. So, I'm sorry. Ah, you can't, you can't knock me down. Oh, look I'm at this. Look, 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 look at the screen. Just in case you don't current of events. Yeah, so you... So you had the definition right, but it's synchronicity. Anyway, glad we cleared that up. You're so proud of your